These are actually used on... And we just put a lock on it to keep them from running out. Because they are off the mind. Yeah. So we have to keep them on chains for probably one or two weeks like that, or one or two days. One or... Sometimes okay. it, it depends on, how, on the law. It's not me. Like I said, I'm just an instrument in the hands of the law. Liberia was founded as a home for freed American slaves in the mid-19th century. Today, it is better known for the civil wars that tore the country apart throughout the 90s and the early part of this century. They were brutal conflicts that killed hundreds of thousands and caused suffering for millions. According to one study, over a third of Liberians are depressed and 44% show symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. To deal with these and all other mental illnesses, the country has just two psychiatrists and one inpatient mental health facility. I'm Sharita Hutton and I've come to Liberia to meet the newly trained mental health clinicians seeking to mend minds on the frontiers of this damaged land. The lack of services for people with mental illnesses means many go undiagnosed or turn to traditional or spiritual healers for help. Dr. Smith? Yes. I'm Sharita. I'm John Smith. Thank you so much for letting us come. Can you take us around? God bless you. Okay. Okay. Dr. Smith is a herbalist based in Monrovia, and like others across the country, he treats many patients for a wide range of mental and physical ailments. Former people that fought in the war, do they come here? Yeah, they come. They come here. Mm -hmm. And what, what kind of symptoms or what kind of problems do they have? Some people come in a war, and some people have... Uh, uh, uh. Some poor have perfect. Some poor did a lot of killing. Some poor now they kill or they stupid. You see them, they are not normal. They come here, they walk, then they're looking for a rescue. They come to rescue them now. They, they come to you to rescue them. But they've seen so much sadness. How, I mean, where do you start? How do you help them? So you go in a bush, you know what type of leaf to get for this type of patient. This one is a medicine that is of health I use. And it looks like something you could just buy at the grocery store. No, that just leaves. I bought it, I put it into this bottle. For all of Dr. Smith's patients, the first course of treatment includes a secret concoction of herbs and leaves, which has been handed down through the family's generations. You believe that you could treat pretty much anyone with this? Anyone that have mental problem, I can treat them. Have hey, let's say, some more who have mental problem, how to treat them. Same stuff. All I want you to do now is just to call the brain. That's all. That's all. He's taking me to show me where the pretty much the next step is. When you, you treat this man, when he comes to his head, then he will be chain for the food. Then he will be chain. The chain will not be for the food again. But if he stay strong, fighting, to put a medicine in his nose, they fighting you, this, that, you want to escape, you change him, then you want to escape. Okay, so these are the people that come to you, you say you need to take this medicine. Uh -huh. They say, no, I do not want the medicine, and so you chain you them, put him. and then administer the medicine. That's the way. Crazy man, if you don't change him, you escape. Then they blame us, the family come to blame us. Is this one of your patients? Yeah. What's, what's wrong with him? He had uh, uh, epilepsy. 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 And you've used the liquid. It, did it work? Yeah. Yeah, improve it. We might get go market and buy one food and come back. Epilepsy, a chronic brain disorder that causes seizures, is one of the world's oldest recognized conditions, and in developing countries, it's often regarded as a mental illness. Would, would you use chains for patients with epilepsy? No. Traditionally, across Liberia, the church has also offered a form of support for people with mental illness. 
Patients in need of more help are looked after by Reverend Snorton at his home nearby. And we are happy that you can come to see what the Lord is doing here. Like I said, this is one of my patients. She's been here about four or five months now, but she was very critical. She would keep clothes on, completely naked on the street. And now she's doing well. In fact, she sleeps in there with us. She just come in here in the day to relax herself up. But she sleeps in there with us. She wake up in the morning, come do cleaning up and other things. She keeps her clothes on now. And I mean, that's the kind of situation. And just simply through prayer. Yes, yeah, just through sweat. prayers, through prayers. You okay. talk about God's work, but these chains yeah. look okay. very scary. These are actually used on, yeah. for these you people? see this chain? I, I have these chains here so that when they bring them and they are very violent, I mean, fighting, I mean, hurting themselves, or running off, you can hardly control them. So we put the chain around the foot and we get a lock and we just lock it. So this actually goes around their arm? Yeah, it goes around, go around the, the leg, the legs. Like, okay. like this. And then we just put a lock on it to keep them from running out. Because sometimes they were running, jumping to the bush, and sometimes you gotta look for them because they are off their mind. Yeah. So we have to keep them on chains for probably one or two weeks like that, or one or two days. One or, sometimes okay. it, it depends on, how, on the Lord. It's not me, like I said, I'm just an instrument in the hands of the Lord. Do you feel like the war may have had some sort of effect on any of their minds? Is yeah, that yeah, I would maybe say, why they come here? I would say that because the war was indeed devastating. To an extent that uh, most of our parents fled and left the kids who had to bring themselves up. So the war seriously contributed to a lot of things that are happening with our young people now, especially with the kind of cases we have. She used to have some horrible dreams, fighting her sleep, her eyes intimidated by nightmares. But she recuperated and I was like, now living with me. She lives with you now. Yeah, she's lived with me now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Like right now, I was saying that uh, we have some cases that they want to bring from Morovia, but those cases are uh, epileptic. Yeah. They fall out with spell, and they want to bring them so we can pray along with But I don't want to mix them up with these other cases that are not epileptic. So. Well, epilepsy is a health condition, not necessarily a... M but uh, I've had some of them here who have recovered through prayers. Many Liberians believe that mental illness and epilepsy are signs of demonic possession or witchcraft and that they can spread from one person to another. This is one of your patients? Yeah, one of my yes. patients who just recuperated from a demonic problem. And so one evening while praying along with him, he fell on the ground and began to manifest, fight on the ground. And then all of a sudden, he came to himself. Do you find it frustrating at all that there's not more help out there for people with these problems? Seriously, not much help. Not much help. I pass sometimes and I'm, I go to Morovia, you see a lot of people you see on the street, it's all because there's no help for them. Even the people that are brought here, it's like uh, they are yes. left with me who takes care of them. I will feed them, I will clothe them. I would do everything for them. Their own parents, their own relatives bring them in. It's like, just forget about them and leave them with me. And so the burden rests on me. One organization that's looking to take on this burden is U.S.-based charity, the Carter Center. I've come to meet some people that are taking a different approach. It's one of these classrooms. Liberian Dr. Janice Cooper, a Harvard-trained expert in mental health, is leading the Carter Center's efforts to improve mental health care. So I think that there's a tendency to think that because we're in a setting that is a post-conflict setting, that all we see is post-traumatic stress disorder. And of course, we do see manifestations of that uh, even this long after the conflict. But we also see uh, the kinds of disorders you would see in any high income, middle income, or low income country, such as depression. And of course, we see uh, anxiety as well as uh, some forms of schizophrenia and other mental health disorders. And we see that across the board, uh, both in community settings and in the only inpatient mental health facility that we have in the country. And there's only one. There's only one. Working alongside the Liberian government, Dr. Cooper's plan is to train 150 new mental health clinicians by the end of 2015. Custody is when you, you think that mental health disorder means to be dangerous. And rights is about conceiving people with mental health disorders. 
in first place as persons with rights, rights holders. So this, this is the shift. People with mental health disorders, they don't have to be hidden and separated by the rest of the society, but they must be conceived as right holders in first place. Uh, I think this particular topic is really hard for medical personnel to get the, a handle on. This whole concept of rights and uh, the right for people with disabilities to access or not access as they choose services. I think medical people often think we're there to help them. These are charities cases and this class is about having them be advocates for people with disabilities and having people with disabilities actually get their own empowerment and become self-empowered and so it's a shift for them and at the beginning of the week they were completely lost and out of it how does this have anything to do with dispensing medications or psychotropics um, and not recognizing that the person with mental health disabilities may not want psychotropics and how do you balance their needs against the needs of society. So um, we have various types of learning that goes on so much of the learning can be from peers and really uh, a topic like this which can be extremely theoretical we need to break down so we get into group sessions and think about what it means. Actually it has to do with uh, these people being uh, somehow stigmatized by them because they, they feel that the causes of these situations is like it is being caused by their, by their own behaviors. It's, it could be a cause culturally, or they have done something wrong, and this is why God is punishing them. And sometimes they said it's, it's a spirit, it's, it's, it has to do with spiritism, that the spirits are maybe annoyed with him because of his behavior. So this is how normally people do feel with these people in the community whenever they come across them. Did you also believe at some point that it was the devil? Of course, yes. This is why we earlier stated that we just give God a glory and thank God a central institution to have come up with this and you know ideology teaching people about these people to know about them that they have somehow significant in the society. But previously, I particularly have that belief. I never knew at the time that it was somehow a mental condition. Did you also believe? Yeah. You believed it was the devil? Yeah. We had that, 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 that man set, as I said, based on our cultural setting. Mm -hmm. uh, Kata Center has been a great help to us. The whole process of the institutionalization is about bringing the services to the community, bringing the services to the people, not the people to the services. Instead of building new mental hospitals, the Carter Center is encouraging the development of community-based care and family support. Mental hospital to community services. From segregation to participation from medical approach to a holistic approach. So mental health is not only a medical problem, it's about uh, inclusive education, it's about employment, it's about social inclusion, it's about political participation. Henry Meliasson lived in relative obscurity, but he possessed one of the world's most famous brains and helped shape our understanding of memory. In 1953, aged 27, the American underwent brain surgery intended to cure his epilepsy. While the removal of parts of his hippocampus, amygdaloid complex and entorhinal cortex reduced his seizures, Meliasson lost the ability to form any new memories. He lived in the present for the rest of his life, unable to store information for any longer than 30 seconds. But Meliasson's life-changing event was a huge opportunity for scientists. Henry could speak, recall long-term memories from before his surgery, carry out tasks like tying shoelaces, and learn some new tasks, such as moving with a walking frame but he was not able to create any new long-term memories like learning new words or recall times and dates. Prior to Meliasson, there was uncertainty about which part of the brain is used to create memories. By agreeing to be studied over several decades until his death in 2008, Meliasson's case transformed the way we understand memory and helped explain how different areas of the brain are linked to specific memory function. Meliasson donated his brain to research. It is still analysed by scientists interested in memory and conditions such as Alzheimer's.
we just saw the students in the classroom. What's the next step? Right, so what we will do is go and see one of our clinicians who's graduated and is now an independent practice in a community. The course is a six month course. They spend five and a half months in uh, training both clinically in the clinical practice as well as in the classroom. And then following that, they have to take a state board exam to be certified as mental health clinicians. So we're off to Bazan in Grand Gita okay. County, which is about a five hour drive, four to five hour drive. It's gonna be a bumpy ride. Bumpy ride, ugh. 55 of Dr. Cooper's graduates have already started working in rural clinics, none of which has ever had a mental health clinician before. This has to be difficult. First of all, kind of understaffed, it, but the traveling that goes into getting to where they need to be is not easy here. Not at all. Many of the clinicians end up driving on motorbikes for a couple of hours at least to get to a backup referral hospital. But if you think if this is hard on the clinicians, imagine how much harder it is on the patients, especially when they're in crisis. Oftentimes it was a case of uh, a patient with mental illness, when they became too difficult to uh, control for the family, the family would tie them up and put them in the boot or trunk of a taxi in order, and then to make the 12, 14 hour journey to Monrovia. With, some, with their family member in the trunk. With the family member who was in crisis in the trunk. Hi, sweetie. So there's normally this many people. Oh yes, absolutely. Oh, here's Margaret. Hi, Margaret. Hi, guys. Mm -hmm. Welcome. It's so good to see you. Margaret Bala was one of the first students to graduate from Dr. Cooper's course, and now works at a remote clinic in southeastern Liberia. This is where we treat our emergency cases. And do you see many of those? So, so on a daily basis. The mental condition, one of the conditions we treat here almost on a daily basis is epilepsy. Which is considered here a mental condition. Sure. Yes. Sure. New cases of epilepsy are nearly twice as common in developing countries as in richer regions because people face a greater risk of infections or injuries to the brain that can trigger the disorder. What, what is this condition? He's an epileptic patient. So in the last three months, he has seizures five times. You don't know what you're doing. Uh-huh. Make him say, he can't go to school. He can't go to school like yesterday, I mean. The last, last week, he, he fell. And when he dropped, the program uh, escaped from him. So nobody goes to help when he has yeah. a seizure. Except my empowerment. Everybody else stands oh, back. Uh, Look at me. They come down with seizures, and then their friends Schoolmates are afraid to go around them. And whenever they try to go back, they stigmatize them. They should continue to come for their medication. And also, after this semester, the second semester, he will try for the boy to go back to school. You enjoy going to school? He loves school. He loves school. He loves school. Uncontrolled seizures can lead to death. Yet, around nine out of 10 people with epilepsy in Africa go untreated, and fear and stigma still surround the illness. Is the medicine, is it expensive? No, no, no. Services here are free. Thank you for coming to the and make sure that you take the medication and for me. Margaret takes us to meet some of the other patients she supports on an ongoing basis. I was having a little mental problem and I explained it to the woman, and she said, oh, the, uh, the health authority will help you. But at the same time, you should be encouraged to be come here. And then later, it will help you a lot. I see I said, you are a high school student. So when are you thinking of going back to school? Despite of your condition, you can do anything that someone out there can do. So he came back to me at the clinic rejoicing. <laughs> I took the entrance, I passed the entrance. And you can see now he's the vice president for the school. That is wonderful. Congratulations. 
uh, from my perspective, it's worth it because I see the pride that they take in their profession. I see the joy they have when they see that the techniques and, uh, and, and tools that they have work. And I think when I see patients, especially their patients, coming back and speaking with such pride and with such happiness as how they have developed this relationship with a clinician. One of Dr. Cooper's other graduates is based at Solo Refugee Camp on Liberia's southeastern border, which houses 6,000 people who have fled violence in neighboring Ivory Coast. Obviously, when uh, people are far away from home and the conflict in Ivory Coast, went, while now is settled, many of these people have remained here because they're not unsure of their safety going back. So we're going to see Naomi, okay. who is a mental health clinician. Hello, Naomi. Yeah, hi, hello. How are you? I'm working. Okay. This is solo camp. This is the mental health unit. What are some of the problems that you see when people come in? They have mental health conditions, depression, psychosis, PTSD, and epilepsy. These are conditions we see here. And kind of explain to us how you treat these people. First of all, we have our psychosocial counselors who go out in the field and identify the cases. They are referred at the clinic here where I do the screening, use the PHQ now to do the screening, and then I go on with the diagnosis and treatment here. And what seems to be the source of it all? What most of them is the war. Some of them lost their property. Some of them lost their family member. Even here at the camp, some of them came with just one family member and they lost that person. So they even get depressed in the camp here. Yeah. Yeah. And it has to be hard knowing that you're not really technically home. Yeah, yes. It's yeah. very hard. Even just living in a refugee camp is depressing all by itself. When I first met, she was turned over from the MSF to me. She lost her husband, her children were killed right before her. And when she came, it, well, every time, we, even when they first came in a place there to do the counseling, she was like crying. But this time you see, yes. she's pregnant now. Yes. She was not a day before, you see that she has improved and she's doing a skill program here at the camp. So. She said for the time she came, she knew so she knew so worry, she knew she knew so eat. But right now, at least the treatment that they gave to her, it helping her. Man, I pray I need to have this way. Me do we? I do a monkey. I say you be saying a song. She said the time they were coming, were entering Africa, they were coming on their way, coming like girl, she or daughter and her mother. So the rebel they met them on the road. And she too, they just took her mother from there, they carried her mom in front of her, they just sat her in front of her. Do you ever see people getting better? Yes, when we first started since last year, 2011, we have discharged over 30 patients from our program now. Surprising, mm. to say the least, to mm. think that there's probably so many more people out there that yes. need help. Yes, absolutely. And afraid to, yes, to come to Afraid you. to come, afraid that other people may learn that they have been here. Yeah. We have a saying that depression is everyone's business. Anyone can get depressed, and almost everybody can recover from depression. Uh, depression is the most common disorder here in Liberia. And I'm really, really proud of the clinicians that are able to bring people out of their homes and often out of the darkness. This is basically the alternative to locking people up in institutions is actually bringing the services, the services as to close them. to them as possible. There should be very, very few people that need to go to institutions, very, very few people that need inpatient care. And when they do, it should be for short periods of time. And we are training our clinicians so that they're part of a community-based strategy. Which doesn't include chains. Absolutely does not include chains, does not include any way of taking the liberty from people with mental illness. Uh, they are entitled to the same freedoms as the rest of us. There really aren't many more words for this, um, but amazing, giving people new hope and new eyesight every three minutes. You do forget you're on a boat.